everybody. Welcome to another brand new episode of It's My House podcast. I am, of course, as always, your host, Chris. And today's guest, well, you know, we, we hear the word legend thrown around so much these days, but there really is no no other way to describe today's guest. He's a legend of the business, spent 22 years refereeing in WWE, a part of huge matches, huge moments. These days, you can find him giving his very strong and blunt opinions on all things wrestling, especially AEW and their referee situation. But we'll get to that a little bit later on. He is, of course, the one and only, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Jimmy Corderas. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for joining me. How, how are things over your side of the world? First of all, thank you for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. And that intro, man, I got to write that down and record it myself because uh, that was awesome. I just hope I could live up to (laughs) all the hype now. And, uh, you know, uh, as far as how things are, I'm good. You know, I'm I'm enjoying life right now as best I can under the circumstances with what's going on in the world today, obviously, with the pandemic and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to outkick my coverage when it came to marriage. So my wife and I are... Are, are wonderful. We're both fully vaccinated and we're still, you know, trying to maintain, you know, protocols and just fingers crossed and praying that, you know, things get somewhat back to normal. It's starting to get there, but uh, I'm afraid, you know, I don't want to see any hiccups along the way. Let's put it that way. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Over here in the UK, things started going back to normal a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Like masks are no longer required. You can still wear them if you want. People are People are starting to really sort of I don't know, shops are reopening, pubs, clubs, right. restaurants, everything's starting to feel a little bit more like we can breathe again and live again. Is yeah. how, how are things where you are? Is everything been back to normal for a little while? Or It's it's slowly getting there. I mean, like, obviously, like, like you said, like restaurants are starting to accept, uh, it started with patios only, like, uh, you know, being yeah. able to eat outdoors. And now they're allowing some seating inside with proper distancing and the whole bit. And, uh, you know, uh, this past weekend, my wife and I finally had our, impromptu uh, uh, date night dinner out, uh, which was kind of cool. It was actually, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, like, I love cooking now. She's an awesome cook. You know, th- there's no problem there with food at home. But at the same time, it's nice to get out once in a while and have someone else cook for you. You know what I mean? And yeah. so we, ha- we had an impromptu date night. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I've, you know, during the pandemic, I never used to bake before. I used to like cooking, but I never did baking cakes and things like that. And now you, you can't stop me. I've made two in the last week. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I do this little thing. I know we get the, uh, every once in a while, I post them out there on my social media, uh, from ref to chef, you know, mm-hmm. where I'm, I'm cooking a little something. My wife takes a few pictures and she says, Hey, put these out there. And I'm like, okay. And then I use the hashtag ref to chef, you know, and, and it's got me thinking, hmm, maybe there is something here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a new, uh, a new line of work for you to get a new career, a new career. Hey, you, ne- you never know. I end up on the food network or something. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Diners, drive-ins, and refs. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to get right into it. Obviously, during sure. my intro, I mentioned, obviously, you, you have a lot of strong opinions, not not afraid to voice them, despite the, the social media backlash that you get from time to time, let's say. Um, yeah. What what has happened to refereeing? Because, obviously, I, I grew up during during the time where you were, you were active in, in WWE, WWF. Uh, Born in 89, really got into it sort of towards the mid to late 90s. So Mm -hmm. you were very much a mainstay of my of my youth, of my childhood, what getting into the business. Um, And thinking back and watching back, I don't really remember ever having too many criticisms of of refereeing. But it seems like over the years, the standards have slipped. Referees don't really feel like they're a part of the match anymore. They don't feel as important. What what's happening? I know, obviously. AEW um, have had a lot of issues, haven't they? Yeah, and I, and I don't want to say that this is just an issue in AEW. It just seems to be more prevalent yeah. there. It's very, you know, and because this is a national brand now, and 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 for those who, out there who are saying, hey, you know, you're being overly critical. Look, I, the only reason I critique it is a, I am a former referee, so I notice things that fans may, I think some fans may not notice, uh, because coming from that world. But at the same time, I'm not doing it to, to, to throw my brothers and sisters and stripes under the bus. I want to see the product, you know, presented in the way I feel. It, I, you know, you say right way, wrong way, in a way that makes sense. How's that? For better, for lack of a better term. And what I see in AEW is, uh, before I get to, to what I see there, 
uh, let me just explain in, in, in pro wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever you want to call it, the job of the referee is to help the talent, the superstars tell their story in the ring. You're not there to be a part of the story unless there's a, a spot or a, a, a something in the match where you become an integral part. Mm. And that's not your call. That is the agent, the talent, whoever wants to make that that call. You you're like <laughs> I'm going to make a stupid reference here that people it's it's like uh, when you look back at different uh, musical acts over the years, you look at KC and the Sunshine Band. You know who KC is because he's the star of the group. But without without the Sunshine Band, but you don't know who the members of the Sunshine Band are because they're <laughs> they're they're helping make that music. But KC is the star, and that's the same way with referee. You're there to help them make their music in the ring. If that makes sense, without being a distraction. I'm I'm just feeling that nowadays I see a lot more referees trying to be characters, trying to get noticed, or if they're not trying to get noticed, they're unintentionally being noticed with being too distracted too much and speaking of distractions i know again i hate to speak only about aew but i notice it there more than other places is distraction of the referees being common but not also uncreative and just it, it, you know what i mean making the referees look idiotic i get it the the old you know uh What's it cliche that the referee, you know, with the with the with the dark glasses and and the, the the tapping stick, you know, but at the same time, when when heels cheat behind a referee's back, don't do it in a way that makes the referees look like idiots. And and it sounds like I'm putting all the blame on the referees, but a lot of it has to do with some of the young talent that don't know how to utilize the referees properly as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And AEW have got obviously quite a lot of younger talent, haven't they? A lot of younger talent coming through, even even some of their top guys, yeah. like MJF. MJF's still very, very young, isn't he? Um, so like mm -hmm. mid twenties, I think MJF is. Um, yeah. What What surprises me is obviously I know AEW are a fairly young outfit now, only coming up to about two years of TV mm -hmm. time. I think it is now in October. Um, obviously they've got Aubrey Edwards over there, who who mm -hmm. fans know know from her, her time in WWE as well. But Earl Hebner. And I know Mike Kyoda was was there only only very briefly, a few a few appearances, refereed mm -hmm. a couple of matches, but right. but these these are really really experienced names. Obviously, Mike Kyoda, I, I had Mike Kyoda on the show about a month ago. Um, mm -hmm. I know he's been refereeing for thirty years or just over thirty mm -hmm. years. So yeah. why are AEW not listening to these guys like your Hebners, like your Kyodas, reaching out to somebody like yourself to to ask maybe like can you come in for a week and, and train our referees, spend some time with them. Why, you know, they've, as I say, fairly young company, but they've made such strides in that short time. They've improved production. They've improved their storytelling. They've improved this, that, and the other. But the refereeing doesn't really seem to have advanced or moved forward. I, I wish I had a good answer for you because, you know, like, like you said, Mike was there for a brief time. I saw him there and I said, Oh, okay. There's a guy with some experience that can, you, you know, communicate and get, you know, mm -hmm. the message across on how to properly utilize referees in a match. Uh, again, it, it's not about the referees, but again, the referee is an integral part of the storytelling process yeah. because in wrestling, you know, we, yes, we know it's a work and it's a, it's, it's the outcomes are predetermined, but it's with the, under the precept that it's an actual sporting event with rules. And if the rules aren't yeah. enforced, then what's the point? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. You have Earl Hebner, who, uh, who is a great teacher of mine, who I learned so much from over the years. You have, even Brian Hebner, yeah. who, who, who yeah, made yeah. a brief appearance there as well. I mean, uh, and here's the thing, and I don't know what it is because there is a wealth of knowledge there in AEW and contrary to popular opinion, I, yes, I do want to see them succeed. <laughs> because as the business grows and succeeds as a whole, everybody benefits. And, and I wish people would stop choosing sides, but that's another topic for another day or maybe yep. later on. But uh, getting back to the refereeing thing, I, I, I'm, I'm worried that a lot of talents, young talents today are not taking advantage of the veterans that they have in the back there. You have your Arn Andersons, you have your Dean Malenko's, you have your Tully Blanchard's, you have Mark Henry, you've got... Uh, Taz, you <clears throat> excuse me, Billy Gunn. If you want to talk about tag team wrestling, there you go. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> are they are they going back and 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 picking their brains and utilizing this knowledge? Um, I remember a while back, uh, Tony Khan was asked about the refereeing situation on Busted Open with by Bully Ray. And he kind of dismissed it like, well, our fans don't care about that kind of stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's that seemed too dismissive. An answer, yeah. it's almost like yeah. he didn't have an answer, a good enough answer to answer why the, the refereeing situation the way it is in, in AEW. I wish he could come back. And look, maybe it's something we could address. Maybe we could tighten the screws a little bit, whatever the case may be. But to dismiss it like that, I thought was, uh, uh, wasn't was fair. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um... Some some other names as well, like Matt Hardy, Christian, all these ex WWE guys. I know we 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 complain and we say, oh, another ex WWE guy, but I I've never really viewed it that way. I don't think, oh, Jericho, oh, Moxley, oh, blah 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 blah. These guys have got so much talent and so much experience. Not just think about it as not just WWE, but TV experience. Mm-hmm. How long has Matt Hardy been on TV? Twenty years, Christian. Yeah, twenty years as well. You know. As you say, these guys could be teaching the younger guys something, but it feels like this This reminds me of um, what The Undertaker said just a few months ago about how the locker rooms have changed and the locker rooms have become soft. Um, and I spoke to Al Snow not too long ago, and he said as well, it's the mentality has changed where the wrestlers are just trying to impress each other and trying right. to get five-star Dave Meltzer reviews and things like that, and they're not mm-hmm. going back and picking the brains and trying to learn and really cramming down and learning a history and things like that so mm-hmm. you know a lot of them are just going back and, and playing video games yeah. in their spare time when they could be you know working working harder to see that th- th- i'm like I'm, I'm not as privy to the locker room as i used to be back in the day but that seems to be the case it seems to be like you said they're more intent on impressing a certain sub core as opposed mm-hmm. to trying to expand their audience I forget who said it. There was a legend who said it best. He says, in the wrestling business, we we don't sell motion. We sell emotion. Mm. That's what draws an audience in. So, But it seems like today's crowd, yes, I get the the business evolves and you you try to grow in, in different ways. But I think, like you said, a lot of today's talents is more concerned about getting their spots in and getting their stuff in and doing more with, with with moves as opposed to more of a storytelling and getting people invested in them. I mean, you can go to a big fireworks display and you go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, but what do you actually remember from that? Other than, hey, that was a, you know what I mean? You, you know, it's yeah. it's like, it's fine to do a twisting, burning 450 hammer Phoenix splash. <laughs> but if you do, if you do sim, seven similar moves in a match, then that big move meant nothing. Yeah. Loses its in, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So, so, you know, and, and the other thing that I'm noticing uh, again, getting on a tangent here, maybe I'm doing a reference rant right here on your show, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the selling aspect of everything too, seems to have changed people. Uh, uh, it, it's like when you perform the guy performing the big move on the person receiving the big move, they used to sell as well to a certain extent, you know, Hey, look, I hit this big move on you, but you know, I'm feeling it too. And it took a little while to crawl over and make that cover. And, and now you can say, well, it took him so long to make the cover. That's why the guy was able to kick out of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tell that story, yeah. you know, anyways, yeah. you know where I'm, going with that <laughs> yeah and that, that seems to be something that as we say we don't want to pick sides we don't want to make this just boo AEW, boo AEW. Right. but i don't notice that i don't have that criticism of wwe nearly as much as i do AEW. um i think the, the commentary team in wwe re- do a really good job of, of selling that even if even if the wrestlers aren't maybe selling it enough themselves right. you'll always hear michael cole saying oh that move took it out of him, so he wasn't. Able, that's that's why his opponent was able to kick out. So at least, right. at least the commentary team are sort of working with the talent mm-hmm. in the ring to tell that story. Whereas I feel like, I don't know, AEW. I don't know what you what how you feel about Jim Ross, but it feels like Jim Ross isn't really invested as much as he used to be. Uh, that's hard. That's hard to say because J- I know J- Jim. He's a, he. You know, he's a legend. Let's put it that way. He's an icon uh, at the play-by-play desk. 
he does his best with what what he is presented. And I know every once in a yeah. while he'll make a little bit of an offhanded comment. But, you know, you have to kind of listen sometimes and go, oh, he took a little jab there, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say he's not as invested. I think it's it's he, uh, sometimes he's taken aback by what he sees. You know, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and 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 it's sometimes uh, when they're doing, like I said, so much, it's hard to articulate you know, when they're taking their time and telling their story, then JR could take his time and help them tell their story because he's a master yeah. at doing that. And I yeah. think sometimes they're going a little too fast and, you know, trying to explain what they're doing when, how can you explain what they just did when they've already moved on to the next thing? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what especially, I mean? with, especially with guys like not to, not to criticize them too much. And it's not just them, but the young books. Their yes. matches are full of so many big moves and big spots and amazing things you've never seen before. But right. Like you said, you don't get time to digest what they've just right. done before they do the next one. And it can be yeah. a little bit exhausting mm. to watch sometimes. Uh, yeah. And again, don't get me wrong. I think the Young Bucks are great. I think they're very talented. Mm. I just, like you said, I wish they just slow down a notch and let things get absorbed, let the audience absorb yeah. what they're doing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was that? What was that quote that you said there? We're not. We're not selling motion. Yeah, selling I, I wish I could. Emotion. I wish I knew who who actually originated the quote. But we're not. We don't sell motion. We sell emotion in pro wrestling. It sounds very. Sounds very Dusty Rhodes. Somebody I, of that ilk that might have said it. I think it was way back. I think it might have been a like a Rip Rogers or. Oh, so much further back then, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I remember hearing the quote, and I'm like, "Wow!" That and it's, it's ingrained. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. I'm going to look it up afterwards. Um, I want to go back to I mentioned Aubrey Edwards in there, and mm -hmm. I always, every time I see Aubrey Edwards, as you say, a little bit of a distraction sometimes. I think he's one of the the main culprits for that, especially in AEW. Mm -hmm. Um. But it, I, I always remember back to when she said that in WWE, they don't allow their referees to have a personality. They don't allow right. the referees to be a character. I, I can think of plenty of referees that have, have been involved, have had characters, have had mm -hmm. parts of storylines. Yourself, Mike Yoda, mm -hmm. um, Lil Nate, you know, Charles Robinson, Earl Hebner, loads of guys, yeah. loads of referees who have, who have been parts of major storylines. What, what did you make of her comments when she said that? Do you think that referees should have a personality and a character or should they just be the referee? I, I, for me, it's, it's more along the lines of, like you said, if you are written into a story like I have been in the past, uh, <clears throat> that's fine. And you can show a little bit of personality, a little bit of character. But to do that on a weekly basis in, and be a, a distraction, um, <clears throat> I don't think that's proper. It's different if it's part of the story. Yeah. And you were written into, like like Earl was written into, sorry, when Charles became Little Nature and, <laughs> and, you know, and that sort of stuff. And yeah. that, I'm okay with that. You know what I mean? It's part of the storytelling process. But to, to say, hey, I'm this character. You know what? Uh, I hate to say it, but nobody's paying money to come see the person in the black and white stripes. Anybody who wanted to come see me in black and white stripes got comp tickets because they're part of my family. <laughs> you know what I mean uh, and you know and if somebody did well my goodness thank you but uh, you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm not on the uh, I'm not on the billboard I'm not on the marquee but uh, uh, again if I can a quick story here my yeah. little are, are you referring to the uh, the 1999 strike angle yes, when yes. I, uh, quick story here that didn't even happen because that happened by accident believe it or not Okay. Um, you know, I had, I had gotten married and went on my honeymoon. JR was head of talent relations at the time. And he was gracious enough to give me two weeks. He says, Hey, take two weeks, go wherever you want. Enjoy. Don't even think about wrestling for two weeks. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. You know, they were hard to do because it's, you know, being yeah. ingrained in yeah. my head, but took two weeks, went on the honeymoon. And that's when they did that angle where the referees went, the regular referees went on strike and they brought in the scab referees like Dr. Tom Pritchard and, and uh, Brooklyn Brawler, and uh, anyway. So I come back from my honeymoon, my first day back, and hey guys, what's going on? And then, you know, they're telling me about this strike angle. And I'm like, wow. So I guess today I'm gonna be joining the rest of the guys with a sign outside picketing. And I ran into Triple H, Hunter. 
And Hunter go, yeah, he used to call me Corduroy was his nickname for me back then. Hey, Corduroy, welcome back. How was the honeymoon? I said, it was great, blah, blah, blah. He says, hey, too bad you don't have a job when you come back. Ha, 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 you know, and stuff like that. And I went, hey, Hunter, I can't afford to go on strike. I just got married. So I, 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 I need to work. And I said it as a joke, ha, ha. And he kind of giggled and he went, ha, ha. He goes, come with me. You know, <laughs> it, it just it just lit something in his in his brain. And he said, and that's when, he brought it to JR and creative that, hey, he's our one regular referee that breaks the picket line. And, you know, and that's when it led to the pay-per-view where the other guys came out and dragged me out. And and speaking of Mike Kyoto, I still owe him a receipt for that, uh, uh, the <laughs> kicks that he laid. But uh, see, see, sometimes stuff just happens and ideas yeah. happen just organically, just talking and stuff like that. You know? Yeah. But that's how it that's happened cool. for me. It wasn't like I was yeah. actively looking to participate in an angle or anything like that. It's it just, yeah. you know. Yeah, and those those are the moments that stick out for me because they're the ones that we didn't expect. They're the ones, you know, mm. I, I think back to the Attitude Era and I think of, I think of The Rock, I think of Austin, I think of Triple mm -hmm. H, but I like to remember certain angles and certain, like I say, the things that stick out for me are the ones that I didn't see coming. You know, not the heel turns, not the face turns, not the championship mm. wins. It's things like right. you getting attacked by like 10 other referees. Right. <laughs> stupid little things like that that I love. Um, I think that's, what's, that's, that's another thing that's missing today with all the information available, readily available now in certain medias, like especially the internet. Uh, the element of surprise, I, I'll give ADW a lot of credit for that. The element of surprise, they've been able to do a lot of that very well. You know, bringing out the, the, the big show, uh, Paul White bringing out Mark Henry, the, uh, Malachi Black, which was, uh, you know, like super shocking, you know, so as far as keeping secrets and able to surprise their audience, they've been very, very good at that. Absolutely. And WWE are, are quite the opposite of that. Yeah. You know, they, they advertise big surprises and, and, you know, we know why yeah. they do it. It's to get people to watch. It's, it's, it's a clever marketing tactic, but mm -hmm. it, it does take away that excitement, that, that, joy especially when you know you get spoilers for results and things like that as well and exactly exactly people are so happy to share them out they're normally behind paywalls but you can't stop a fan paying for that paywall and then just spreading it themselves you know it's no, a shame. It, exactly and I, like you said i get why they do it to, tr to drum up some interest and get people to go oh what john cena's coming back you know that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. but at the same time it's kind of like Oh, if it was a surprise, then the people who read it online go, oh, I should have been watching because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to watch next week just in case something happens. Yeah, exactly. There you go. So it's sort of like a double-edged sword. Yes. Really, isn't it? Because yes. when, yeah. when I found out Goldberg was coming back, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. great. I won't watch Raw then because now I know what's yeah. happening and right. I know I'm not going to enjoy it. Um, on, on the subject of AEW there, like, you get a lot of um, you get a lot of criticism yourself on, <laughs> on Twitter. Obviously, it's it's that it's what you said before about people picking sides and tribalism, and you know mm. you you have to pick a side. You have to draw a line. You're either AW or you're with the evil WWE. But, but evil just, empire, you, yeah, evil <laughs> empire. But you you've just been very um, complimentary of AW there. I, I, do you think obviously obviously when WCW ceased to exist when Vince McMahon brought WCW out, who we went for a very long time with, with no real alternative to WWE. Mm -hmm. There was obviously Impact and Ring of Honor, but they were not, not even close. TNA, yeah. all those kind of guys. Do you think that the introduction of AEW has been good for the wrestling community? Because my opinion would be, yes, it's great that we've got an alternative. When it, when mm -hmm. it first started, I was happy. I wasn't looking for a way out of watching WWE. I just wanted... Something a bit different. If I didn't right. feel like watching WWE one week, but I still wanted to watch wrestling on, on a major network or, or whatever, I might mm -hmm. seek out AEW. So it was cool to have that extra option. But obviously, it's also done a lot of damage to wrestling fans, as I say, with the whole dividing people, people feeling like they have to attack other people for their opinions right. and the things that they like. So how, how do you feel AEW, within these first two years, have they done more good than bad or more bad than good? I think, I think, again, uh, I don't think it's either or. I think, for one thing, they've done overall good for the wrestling business because they've sparked more interest. And I think they're, they're, they've got a fan base that's rabid. And, uh, but the thing I don't like is, for some reason, 
it's turned into, like you said, almost like this tribalism where it has to be one or the other. And for me, I, look, I, I if, again, contrary to popular opinion, I like watching AEW. There are aspects of it that entertain me and I find enjoyable and stuff like that. But there are the technical aspects in, the, in the, it, as far as storytelling or something like that. I'll see in a match and go, oh, that didn't work for me. Or like I said, with the critiques with the, with the referees, when guys are outside the ring for like two minutes and I'm going, how, how is this possible? You know what I mean? That's the kind of stuff that bothers me. Other than that, I'm very entertained by their product. Like you, you, they have different aspects on the show. You mentioned Christian earlier, uh, Christian's match the other, uh, the other day with, um, oh, oh my goodness, who did he work out at? My goodness. Why is my brain? Dead? See what I mean? Too many ref bumps. Over the years. <laughs> um, he had a heck of a match on, 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 uh, on this past uh, dynamite. Um, a nice, different from what everybody else was doing. It wasn't high spot oriented. They did some big moves, but it, but it was a nice story being told, and it was, took its time in progressing and so on and forth. Jericho, who's a master at storytelling, you know, in his match with Hoovy, was, was awesome. And even the Cody Rhodes match, surprisingly, with Malachi Black and Malachi Black getting getting over so strong. Yeah, it destroyed him. Yeah, uh, you know, destroyed. there's a story there, but at the same time, now I'm curious to see what happens. You know, that kind of stuff, when you're playing with my mind like that, now, I, like I said before, you're selling emotion, not motion. Uh, the other matches, you know, there's cool with high spots and stuff like that, where you go, oh, hey, yeah, that was nice, blah, blah, blah. But it, it, again, uh, it's a nice variety of stuff. And everything in wrestling needs to be a variety, especially uh, on Monday nights when you have a three-hour show, which is more time to fill. You know, <laughs> it, it's a little bit harder. This, you know, you have your good match. You have your match with uh, high spot oriented. You have your comedy and comedy is great in wrestling when it works, when it doesn't work, <laughs> then th that's a different story. But uh, for overall, I just don't like, like you said, the tribalism where it has to be one or the other because it doesn't have to be one or the other. And I compare it to like politics where, where myself personally, I can speak for myself. I'm apolitical. I don't subscribe to party politics where you have to be left or right or whatever. I listen to what they have to say. And if it resonates with me, regardless of what party they belong to, well, th that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I don't, yeah. I don't care what color your lawn sign is. <laughs> yeah. Same. No, it's, it's very much the same over here as well. Um, I, when I vote, I tend to vote for whatever sounds the best, whatever's going to work for people the best, not just myself, but just for, for my community and things like that, my my yeah. local area, my constituents or whatever you would call them. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I wanted to um, I wanted to touch upon another thing that hasn't really made much sense recently. This is something I'm sure that you I, I'm pretty sure I saw you commenting on it on Twitter. Um, the 24 seven title. Obviously, mm -hmm. you were a part of WWF, WWE when the hardcore mm -hmm. title. Was, yes. was hugely popular. It was always one of my favorite things to, to tune in and watch. I'll mm. always remember the hardcore triple threat at um, yes. WrestleMania 17, you know, mm -hmm. the chaos, the nonsense, just the fun and the silliness. Yes. The 24 7 title is obviously built to be the, the current generation's version of the hardcore title, mm -hmm. just maybe with, with less weapons, because obviously times have changed. No headshots, no chair shots, things like that. Right. Um, but it's very quickly become, it's very quickly gone from extremely entertaining with the likes of our truth and Drake Maverick mm -hmm. to just being a bit of an annoyance. And it also doesn't really make much sense. And I think this is what you pointed out. They they recently had a match for it, a regular in the ring with a referee mm -hmm. match. This is a title that can be won. No rules. No, you know, no rules, no barriers. You can win it anywhere in the arena. You can mm -hmm. win it on Saturday Night Live. You can win it in football stadiums, you know. Right. So then all of a sudden we've got a match in a ring with a referee that ends with a disqualification. Mm. And I just was sort of sat there like, okay, I have com now completely lost all interest in this because I want my wrestling mm. to at least have an, an element of it making sense. Right. So this is sort of similar to the the declining refereeing standards mm -hmm. what what's going on here because the hardcore title you never questioned the hardcore title no did you? it just made no. sense no it would made sense and again it was a fun title and i one of my fondest memories when it comes to the 24 7 hardcore championship was when crash holly was champion and he was hiding and sleeping in the apa office and <laughs> myself myself and gerald briscoe snuck in 
and did the the quiet no sound count one two three yeah. and yeah. Mr. Bris Mr. Briscoe became the <laughs> the hardcore champ. See, that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be different from everything else out there. That you know, different than the Intercontinental Championship, different than the United States Championship. It's supposed to be unique and and fun. Like you said, yeah. you mentioned WrestleMania 17, going around the entire dome there and getting on the back of the golf cart with Kane driving and stuff like that. <laughs> it, it was fun. It was yeah. that's what it was meant to be. Now it's just it, it feels like it's okay. It just become another low level title. How oh, hum? Yeah, to fill a bit of time. Yes, yes, that's exactly. What it feels like now. Yeah, um, and like I say, you've got you. Who was it who said? Um, I think it was Al Snow who who I asked about it, and he said. It should be one of those titles where it, it gets TV, it gets TV time, and yet you've got mm -hmm. guys who see the belt on the floor during a segment, during a promo, after a match, whatever, and they're not going for it. They're not going to win it. You should have those mid-card or undercard guys trying to win that so that mm -hmm. they can get some TV time. But when, when wrestlers who are, for lack of a better word, irrelevant at, at times are not trying to win championship gold that's there in front of them right. on a silver plate what does that say about that title it, exactly it, it makes it feel um unimportant yeah and, and everybody and wanted makes the it... hardcore title everybody yeah. wanted that the undertaker was was hardcore champion exactly so you know what i mean <laughs> it, 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 when you when you make it feel it when you making it feel important make it feel different that's that's the whole idea and i just like i said yeah. earlier it just feels like just another title ho hum yeah. I mean, don't get already... me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Reggie Reginald or Reggie, as he's known now, mm. is very athletic. But at the yeah. same time, uh, other than that, what is drawing me? What, 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 why am I getting emotionally invested in this person? Our truth, I was emotionally invested in because I found him entertaining, funny, you know, charismatic. You know, now it's it's just like you, like I said, not just another title. Yeah, and there's there's already too many. <laughs> Too many yep. of those, isn't it? You know, exactly. That's another, that's another criticism for for another day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right. One thing I really wanted to talk to you about. This is another a really fond memory, um, but from a little bit later on, um, the ruthless aggression era. I think it was sort of like the the early stages of that. Um, Kurt Angle and the whole Daniel Puder Ooh, situation. Yeah. I've always been really interested in this, and I've, I've read a few things, but obviously, I, I couldn't couldn't pass up the chance to get get something from you yourself as I'm, I'm talking to you now um so for anybody who doesn't know obviously um it was the final stages of tough enough that year um kurt angle i think it was an unscripted segment i don't think this was was in any way scripted at all was it well uh to, to, to just to to play off of what you're saying there the the segment was uh I don't want to say scripted, but it was it was planned out. Where the uh, okay during the day they had the contestants do wind sprints up and down the ramp, eat plates of pasta, you know, doing all these crazy challenges, you know, and stuff like that. And then the finals was going to be in the ring. We used to call them burpees, squat thrusts, yes. and just have the guys just go and do squat thrusts until everybody until there was one guy left. Yes. And um, Daniel Rodemeyer, I think, was the guy who ended up being the the last one left. Uh, and for his efforts, he got to have an impromptu amateur wrestling match with Kurt Angle. And that was what was supposed to happen. That's what, you know, so I'm in the ring with Charles Robinson and Al Snow, who yeah. is, you know, the tough enough uh, coach and leader. And so they did their little thing and Kurt Angle made short work of uh, uh, Dan and that was done and over with. And we thought the segment was done. But Kurt walks over and looks over at the rest of the guys down there. Anybody else want to challenge the Olympic gold medalist? And Daniel Pewter put his hand up. Oh, right. So that so, was the part that was unplanned. So so Kurt says, okay, come in here, young man. And I looked at Charles and he looked at me and we both went. And then I looked <laughs> back at I looked back at Al, right? Al looked at me and he, and he gave me that look like Kurt's going to do what Kurt's going to do. Like, what am I supposed <laughs> to do? You know what I mean? Yeah. So... <laughs> They started and they went into it and they started going. And again, uh, I get that, you know, we wear the earpiece back in the day. And it's like Gerald Briscoe says, like, Jimmy, what are they doing? And I'm like, don't look at me. I, I mean, I didn't call this, you know. What I mean? <laughs> so uh, not being an MMA expert, 
but I kind of got the feeling that once he got him in that, that key locker Kimura, yeah. I went, Ooh, this is not good because yeah. If Kurt can't get out of this, he'd rather lose his arm than, than you yes. know. Uh, well, again, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at Al, and Al's got this look on his face like, oh, no. So I, in my mind, I'm thinking, how do we get out of this? How do we, you know, without yeah. embarrassing your Olympic gold medalist? So <laughs> when they fell down and Kurt landed on top, it was just instinctive reaction. It wasn't, I wasn't told. And nobody yeah. said, hey, do this. When they landed... I said, the heck with it, I'm counting. And I was going to count three regardless. And, and you know, yeah. of course, looking back, thinking it was an amateur contest, so I could have just did one. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I'm in a professional wrestling ring, and that's how, I'm, that's how my brain oh, works. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I counted three, despite the fact that uh, Pewter rolled his shoulder after two. Uh, mm-hmm. I counted three, the match was over. Kurt got face-to-face with him, cut a promo on him in the ring, which I can't repeat here. And, uh, <laughs> you know... Uh, and and I'll give Pewter credit because while he was getting chewed out, he was going, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. And then he said, get out of my ring. And he got out. And I didn't know what to expect walking to the back. So I walked to the back and I, I didn't want to be around, you know. And so as I walked through gr- the gorilla position, I saw Gerald Briscoe there and he didn't say anything. He just looked at me and just gave me a, a, like a quiet little thumbs up <laughs> i went and i just walked down and i ran into fit finley and fit says you know who did they tell you to count i said no fit i just did it i don't know why i just did it and he says well you probably saved kurt's arm and i went yeah. and i'm thinking i like i'm not saying this to pat myself on the back but it was like oh my goodness if there's one thing i could be proud of it's like ending that yeah yeah absolutely what was um what was vince's reaction did, did you see vince when you went back no, nope. Vince is usually up there in Gorilla during the show, and uh, I don't recall seeing him there. It's just I, I kind of bolted right through Gorilla before anybody. Like I said, I just saw briefly yeah. Mr. Briscoe give me the, the quiet thumbs up, and, and I just bolted out of Gorilla. And uh, after that, did not see Mr. McMahon. Do he didn't he didn't search me out either. So I, I'm hoping everything was cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you speak to to Kurt afterwards? No, did, I wasn't. Did you know going, what I, you did? No, nope, I was not going to bring it up. I was just going to let him be. I didn't want to go up and, and stir the pot. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Another thing that I really wanted to talk to you about is, um, obviously, I'm sure you were probably expecting this. I'm sure most people that you speak to ask you about this. Um, one of the most, unfortunately, infamous things that's ever happened in WWE history. You already know what I'm, I'm going to ask about. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, the horrific tragedy, the, the untimely, unfair passing of, of Owen Hart. Um, mm-hmm. We've read so much about it over the years. We've seen the voice documentary, Dark Side of the Ring. We've heard from Brett. We've heard from Owen's wife. We've heard from everybody. But, uh, you know, as much as we remember what happened, or, or as much as we've heard, because obviously mm-hmm. not that many people saw what happened, mm-hmm. Um I think what a lot of people either don't know or don't realize or don't remember is that obviously you were the man in the ring at the time. Um, obviously, very delicate subject. So if you don't want to talk about it, that's that's no. obviously absolutely fine. Um, but what 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 was sort of like your your instant reactions? Obviously, when when talk talk me through what happened because obviously, yeah. as as Owen fell, did did you know what had happened when it happened or was it did, did you? turn around straight away and see and think oh shit what what happened there or it, it it's so you know again there's certain things that are vivid in your mind like uh, to, just to set the stage for people um right before the unfortunate incident that happened there there was a hardcore match that took place in the ring mm. and yeah. i had gone to the ring because i was referee the own it was Owen Hart versus uh, as a blue blazer versus yeah. the godfather yeah. So I had gone to the rink to help some of the guys clear out some of the debris that had been left there, those scraps of the tables and stuff like that. Um, so while the, there was an interview, pre-taped interview playing on the Jumbotron, on the big uh, screen of Kevin Kelly interviewing the Blue Blazer, who was on. And I was holding the top rope with my left hand and kicking stuff out of the ring. And I was moving towards uh, that corner uh, that corner and um, 
it, it, it's hard because it happened so, so fast that as I was moving towards that corner, there is a Tim Rogers, I believe was the young man who was sweeping out the ring with a broom. Um, I felt something brush against this, the right side of my head and my shoulder. And at that same instant, the top rope that I was holding with my left hand had pulled out and snapped back and like hit my fingers. And my first instinct was to do this and duck kind of like, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, did the top rope just break? Did the, uh, is somebody throwing something in the like I didn't know what what it was and as I you know kind of got turned around I looked and and Owen was there laying face up and it's so weird because I could I wasn't putting two and two together I knew he was to descend yeah for for the match but I'm I'm not I'm not putting two and two together and understanding what the situation here and I'm confused for a few uh, I don't know how long it was, but then I, I kind of knelt down and, and, and called out a few times and there was no response. And I could see even with the mask on, his eyes were open and it was, he was ashen for lack of a better term. So uh, um, Mark Yaten, who was our timekeeper um, and uh, I, you know, he was on headset and I, I, by this time King had got up as well. And I just started screaming, like, we need help out here. Get somebody out here now. Something is wrong. Again, not putting two and two together. I'm not saying, oh, my goodness, this guy fell. I, yeah. I just, you know what I mean? I'm confused. Yeah. And I'm so the, you know, the, the, the ring started filling up with paramedics and, and, you know, people from the back and stuff like that. And they put the, uh, the air thing and somebody was doing the chest compressions and they got him on the stretcher. They started wheeling him back and I just f followed them back and, and watch them load him, load Owen into the ambulance. And, and I was like shaking. I was a panicky mess. And um, I used to smoke back then. So somebody gave me a cigarette and I sat down on the steps outside, you know, kind of like, you know, nervously smoking. And uh, John D'Amico, who worked uh, in production, says, come on, let's go. And I said, where are we going? He says, I got your stuff. We got to go get you checked out. And I said, I'm fine. He says, no, no, no. We got to go get you checked out. It's protocol. He started going through all this stuff. So they finally convinced me to go get checked out and that. So they took me to the same hospital that they took Owen to. And that's where I found out that he had passed. And it was just, uh, I ended up calling my fiance, my wife, who was my fiance at the time and just saying, Hey, this is not good. And uh, that's how I found out he passed. And then, then that's when stuff started clicking. When you started hearing people saying, yeah, he fell and stuff like that. And to this day, and I tell people this, and they say, I don't remember leaving the hospital. I don't remember going from Kansas City to St. Louis for Raw the next night, whether we drove, whether we were on the, the crew bus, whether we flew. It's all a blur to me. And I just remember the next day walking into this, the arena in St. Louis and running into Jerry Lawler. Um, and, and he said, uh, are you okay? And I said, I guess as okay as I'm going to be. He says, I hate to tell you this, but you don't know how close you became to being a bigger part of this story. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, he told me that he saw maybe the last 20 feet of his fall or so. And the first thought that went through his mind was, oh my God, he's going to land on the ref, Jimmy. Wow. So, it was not and so, wow. so what brushed against the side of my head and my shoulder was Owen. And now I, I broke down. <clears throat> and I started feeling guilty now. It, hard to explain this. I started feeling guilty because here's here's a young man who lost his life. Here's a, a family who lost a, a son, a husband, a father. And I'm feeling guilty because I'm feeling fortunate that I wasn't, that I was spared. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to explain it. You know, uh, it, and then it was just really, really playing on my mind. And then I ran into JR and JR says, listen, you want to go home? We'll send you home. You know, you don't. And I felt like, no, JR, I think I need to be here with everybody. Yeah. We're all feeling this right now, as, as terrible as it is. And, you know, later on that day, I did run into Vince and he just, you know, gave me a big hug and was at a loss for words. He was crying. Like, I'd never seen him like this before. And he just, he's reiterated everything. You need anything, you come to me. And, uh, you know, even, even Taker, who was our locker room leader, Taker, same thing. He says, you need anything, you come to me. And I was like, I appreciate that. So, but it was, again, 
it's amazing that some things are so vivid in my mind and other things I just can't recall. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, it happened so quickly mm. that you, you wouldn't have had time to digest yeah. what had happened. And, and is it, I don't know if this was just a rumor or if I, you know, I, I wasn't watching the event at the time. I was, I was still mm. quite young. I wasn't mm. over in the UK. We didn't have much access to, to watching shows live, especially on a mm. Sunday and then right. having ball on the Monday or whatever it would be. Um, gotcha. So was it, was it, did the show carried on? Didn't it? Yes. The show carried on afterwards. And, yeah. and I've heard things, as I say, I don't know if it's just rumor and hearsay, but, but Vince was as, as Owen was, was going back on the stretcher as he was being taken out the back, mm. Vince was just sort of saying like to people, go, go, you're on next. So was it, was it just a case of like the show must go on? Owen would want the show to go on or it w- were, were the other guys in the locker room happy to, to carry on with the show? Or did they all just want to stop? I, I really have no idea. I wish I could answer that question. Cause like I said, I followed the stretcher to the back. I've walked outside the building and watched them load them in. And from outside the building, like I said, John, John D'Amico had got my, my gear, all my stuff and put it together to take me. And so I wasn't back there to see what the reaction was. I didn't know at the time that the show had continued. I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't know what was going on. All I knew is I was, I, I was at the same f- facility that Owen was at and that's where I found out. And, and again, after that, it became, after talking to my fiance on the phone, everything was a blur after that. Yeah. What was, what was the immediate future after that? Like, did, did it, did it sour anybody's feelings towards Vince and WWE? Cause I know obviously a lot of different people have have placed the blame on a lot of different shoulders. A lot of people right. have blamed Vince. A lot of people blame the production guys, whoever it was that did the rigging of the actual mm. wires. You know, nobody's ever really fully taken all shouldered all of the blame. I don't think anyway. Right. Um, so, mm. what was especially within the Hart family? What was it like moving forward? Did WWE make any WWF and Vince make any changes to make sure things like this didn't happen again? Um, that, that is something that I, I, I wasn't privy to. Um, let, let me put it this way. When, when it came to the Owen subject, other than the fact that they were, uh, you know, the WWE contacted all of us and said, whoever wants to go to the funeral in Calgary, uh, we will take you there. Uh, you know, you, we will, you know, instead of you having to go on your own expense. But other than that, you know, I don't remember a lot of chatter about, you know, about it afterwards because it was almost like, I don't want to say that the subject was, it just wasn't <clears throat> approached with me because I think people realized how close I was to the situation that they didn't want to yeah. bring it up again. Yeah. So I, I didn't, I didn't hear a lot about it and I didn't talk really to anybody about it except, you know, my, my own family and a few really close friends, you know, like, like, like back then uh, Tony Chimmel was very close and, you know, uh, Mike, and stuff like that but other than that uh, you know i i really stayed away from that topic yeah yeah but don't blame you <laughs> i really yeah. can't blame you to be honest um yeah. so right so let's thank you for being so open and honest and, and happy to talk about that i know it's obviously even after all of these years you know every every yeah. time you hear the name owen hart we're still mm-hmm. filled with so mm-hmm. much sadness such a incredibly Absolutely. talented guy i honestly i always preferred him over brett that was mm-hmm. just my my personal taste. So it's- <clears throat> That's the unfortunate thing is, uh, and no, we got to see a, a, a true talent in the ring, but we didn't get to see his full potential because, uh, you know, gone far too soon. Yeah, yeah, and I completely understand his his widow's wishes and feelings towards him not mm-hmm. going to the Wii or Hall of Fame. I hope right. one day it can happen because it would be lovely for yes. everybody to get that that one more chance to to celebrate his life and his achievements and his career. Um, so, yeah, Agreed. but let's move on, get on to something a little bit um, less okay. sad, mm-hmm. um, try and move it along. Um, so, not not necessarily in terms of the wrestling and what we see on the TV, but I, I'm interested to get your thoughts on what you think of WWE as a whole at the moment, because the, the company seems to be in a really weird, mm. I don't know, in a really strange state of flux at the minute, where obviously... Yeah. We've we've come out of of COVID, out of the the pandemic. Things are starting to settle back down a little bit. Obviously, there mm-hmm. were a lot of releases, a lot of unfortunate releases, mm-hmm. lots of surprising releases, especially mm-hmm. recently with the likes of 
Samoa Joe, and then he came back five minutes later. Um, yeah. Andrade, Alistair Black, Braun Strowman, mm-hmm. Bray Wyatt, of all people in the world to release Bray Wyatt. Mm. What what do you think's going on with WWE? There's there's a lot of chatter around potential mm. sales. You mm. know, the likes of Disney or NBCU, and maybe they're trimming trimming the roster down to make a more attractive sale. Obviously, right. we've had a huge decline in ratings over the years. Mm. You know, over the last 10, 20 years, 15 mm. years, it's got worse and worse. But at the moment, mm. you know, from one week to the next, Raw will hit, I don't know, let's say 1.7 million. And then the next mm. week, their record low. Like, what is right. what, what do you feel is wrong with the product at the minute that's maybe <sighs> taking people away? Or taking people I, think, I think it's inconsistency, especially on, on Monday nights. We're not seeing... Yeah. It, Monday nights, again, I... I I, I get it three hours because uh, NBC Universal are, are paying or Peacock are paying them for three hours of programming and they're making a pretty penny off that. So I understand why it's three hours. But at the same time, three hours is a long time. You know, pay-per-views were three hours. But yeah. then you got to remember that you have another two hours on Tuesday night with NXT. And then you got another two hours on Fox here in, 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 in North America with SmackDown. Plus you've got the, the syndicated shows like Main Event and... Uh, yeah. 205 Live and all that kind of stuff. NXT There's, UK. And, and, yeah, NXT UK. And then you've got AEW on Wednesday nights, which is now going to go on, on Friday nights as well when Rampage ramps up in a week. I think it's next week. Is it next week? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. you got uh, here, here we got Impact Wrestling on Thursday nights. And, uh, you know, you've got your ROHs and their MLW. There's a lot of content out there to absorb. And there's a lot of different presentations out there. I think even within WWE, you look at their three main shows, which are Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. Each show is presented in a different fashion. I think, you know, it, it almost feels like Raw is the entertainment show or tries to be. You know what I mean? Uh, NXT for me is probably my favorite show because in my opinion, it is the best blend of old school meets new school. Yes. 100%. I think th- I, th- I think they're doing it in a correct manner, but I don't know if that resonates with the casual broader audience as much as it does the pro uh, a pro wrestling fan. That's the only issue I have with it. SmackDown, I think right now is the one that is the one that is the perfect blend of, you know what? We have good wrestling. We have some great characters. We have a potential here to draw a larger casual audience. I think they're doing it better than anybody right now. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't enjoy AEW, but AEW is catering to a certain audience so to speak, yeah. if you yeah. know what I mean. So yeah. uh, they have to figure out a way to cater to that casual fan that, that has possibly lost a little interest and, and bring them yeah. back. I think, like I said, I think SmackDown is, uh, for now, on the road to doing it correctly and maybe gaining some of that audience back, but it, it's going to take time. Plus, people are absorbing their wrestling in different ways now, where before you had to watch it live if you wanted or set your tape machine. And then it became DVR. Now I could record it on DVR. Now you can just go anytime and just pull it up. Yeah. You know, anyway. so so that yeah. so so it almost feels like uh, I don't have to see it live. And that's the yeah. other thing too. They're not making you feel like, hey, I have to tune in on Monday night at eight o'clock here Eastern time, five o'clock Western, whatever, because I got to see what happens. It's it, it almost feels like they've gotten to the point now where. Okay, if I'm busy on Monday night, I can just watch it when I get a chance. Yeah. They're not, they're not, they're not, like I said, they're not grasping. They're not getting people emotionally invested to want to see it as it yeah. happens. Yeah. Um, and I think um I sorry to keep name dropping guests that I've no. had in the past, but um no. when I spoke to Vince Russo, he made a really, really good point that think of your your bad bunnies and people like that who come mm-hmm. in. They bring in a load of casual viewers, and that's great. They bring in fans of 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 that type of, of bad bunny. Mm-hmm. So you bring in maybe like the Hispanic audience a little bit more, right. and um, and you bring in fans of that genre of music and 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 that kind of thing as well. A bit like with with Mike Tyson back in back in the Attitude Era, and yes. since then we've had Floyd and we've had Jack and people like that. But when they were doing it in the '90s and the Ruthless Aggression Era. You'd have those big stars, and then you'd have something immediately after. So that if if a casual viewer has tuned in to see a Bad Bunny, something great happens afterwards that keeps them in the hook. 
and there's no right. hook anymore. It's just, oh, John Cena's here. Well, yeah, great. Let's watch for the first 20 minutes. Oh, no, yeah. John Cena's gone. Let's change right. the channel. They don't really right. do anything to keep you there. And it's so like they don't want to make stars anymore because they're worried that those stars are going to are gonna leave, much like The Rock, much like John Cena. That's, 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 that's one of the issues right now is because in the WWE, they, they're selling the WWE as the star. You know what I mean? The company is first and foremost. And I get that. I understand that. But at the same time, like you said, back in the day when Mike Tyson showed up and confronted Shawn Michaels, next thing you know, the next segment, bong, here comes The Undertaker. Yeah. So you're like, wow. You know what I mean? So there's something there. And unfortunately, again, one of the issues today is there's too much of a gap between that upper card, your top baby faces and heels. And, you know, there's not that upper level just beneath heels and baby faces, if you know what I mean. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap from the top stars to mid-level card, let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and yeah. again, Roman Reigns right now, for me, is the guy that's hitting it out of the park. If there's a guy that, you know, Edge is on fire right now. Uh, you got Seth Rollins, who's in the mix up top there. The, they're starting to elevate Big E, but he's not there yet. I think there's a potential there for him to be the. But again, after that, it's it's kind of like um, uh, okay. I hate to again plug my ref and rants, but one of my rants this <laughs> this past week was with Keith Lee beating uh, Karrion Cross. Yep, yep. <laughs> and people are people are like, why is Karrion Cross losing? on Monday Night Raw, yet they're building him up as this huge monster on NXT, this undefeatable guy. It's, yeah. it's losing steam on Tuesdays because of what's happening on Mondays. And I thought with Keith, the issue with Keith Lee is, it's not that he defeated Karrion Cross per se, but who else could he defeat that would be on an upper level that would make that win relevant? Yeah. Outside, yeah. Out, like, you could, who's there? I mean, you look at the Raw roster, eh, maybe a Sheamus... You know what I mean? Uh, who's the U.S. champion? Yeah. You know, uh, is it Drew, a ring? Now that he's not at the very top, right? But at the same time, they're still trying to keep Drew on that upper level. So yeah. Yeah. that, in their minds, the loss Drew losing to to uh, to to Keith Lee would would not be good for Drew, but it would yeah. definitely elevate Keith. But there yeah. isn't that guy that could, you know, that. You know, Keith Lee is a baby face and obviously he needs to defeat a, a, a solid heel. There isn't that solid heel that's upper mid card for him to get that win for that would be meaningful. Yeah. So there's that gap. There's that th there's what's missing right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you're, and you're right as well with on the SmackDown side of things. Roman Reigns has been unbelievably good. Nobody. If, if anybody says yeah. that they expected this of Roman Reigns. That person is a liar because nobody expected this. Roman yeah. Reigns could not cut a promo to save his life. And now, <laughs> yeah, all of a yeah. sudden, he's yeah. he's literally, he's moving the needle basically all by himself. Yes. But I love SmackDown. I very much agree with you on where all three shows are at. But it doesn't feel, it genuinely doesn't feel like there's anybody that can take that belt away from Roman now because they've done such a good job of mm -hmm. building him and elevating him and making him seem indestructible if edge couldn't do it right. if daniel bryan couldn't do it right who's gonna do it apart from i love biggie biggie is an incredible wrestler an incredible promo guy a great worker all around mm -hmm. he's got a great look his energy he could sell yeah. tickets he could go on chat shows he could go on the you know the the daily yeah. shows and all that kind of stuff but mm -hmm. i still don't think he can beat roman reigns because they've done such a good job of, of building roman are, are you are you in the same camp as me where you you didn't expect this of Roman is it, is it all because of Paul Heyman? I, I think is a, a bit of everything. I think is a little sometimes you when you find your groove and, and Paul Heyman, you know, is definitely a big plus and a big help to Roman's yeah. current uh, elevation. But uh, uh, also the fact that Roman now because he's found his groove has a little. I don't want to say he's got creative freedom, but he's got a little more freedom now to be. Yeah. It, it, as Stone Cold used to say it. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin was Steve Austin cranked up to 12. Yes. And that's what Roman is right now. And he's feeling yeah. it. He's in his wheelhouse. He's doing it right. So it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort. And I think uh, sometimes I think young talent today needs to learn how to 
take elements of what they're seeing from the old school guys. I'm not saying, you know, old school is, is the right school, take elements of old school, incorporate it into today and make it blend and mesh well. And, yeah. and a lot of that yeah. comes from, from, from some of the guys who, who did it back in the day. And uh, um, Paul Heyman is, I know he's been called a genius and I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with that, but here's a guy who's also been able to tap into what works today you know, uh, through history, like ECW, when he, when he was head of ECW, he tapped into something that was working. And, you know, especially now with the audience coming back, that's what you predicate how you move forward on is how your audience is reacting. Yeah. The, yeah. the whole industry is based on audience reaction. Yeah. And, and if they're reacting and they're, they're buying into what you're selling, Okay, we're onto something here. But if the, the the fans are like, ah, well, and they're sitting on their hands, and now you know, okay, this isn't working. We have to try something else. And that's what was good about live events, house shows, the, yeah. which is yeah. what's lacking right now. Because you know, you used to go to those live events and you do be in front of a live audience, and you were able to try different things and see what worked. That's yeah. the only difference now. Now you're doing it in front of a an audience on TV, so you're not you don't have that wiggle room to experiment as much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and coming back to what you said a few minutes ago, I've been, I've been extremely critical of AEW over the over the mm -hmm. two years. Not because I don't like the show, but because I, I, I enjoy elements of WWE. I'm very critical of WWE as well. I mm -hmm. want both shows to be great. I really do. Yes. I want both shows to to pull me in and keep me in. And I think one of um, what you mentioned about mixing it up with the old school and the new school, AEW do that really well. You know, mm. having having Arn with Cody, having Sting with Darby Allen, having Taz with Team Taz, all younger guys, all in, mm -hmm. all about to approach their prime. But you've got mm -hmm. those old hands there to guide them. And you know, I get I get a feeling Darby Allen is the kind of guy backstage who speaks to Sting, speaks to Jim Ross, speaks to these guys to try and learn from them mm -hmm. and learn the old ways of doing things. And I think right. that's I think that's one of AEW's strengths. Like I said. Way back earlier in the in the in our in our chat, um, mm. they brought in a lot of ex WWE guys, but they're using them really well. They're not just putting them on screen to say, "Hey, tune in tonight because we've got Sting." Right. They're, they're using them cleverly. I get a feeling that Paul White is backstage mentoring the big guys. I get a feeling that Matt Hardy mm. and Christian are mentoring the tag teams and Tully and Arn and right. You know, so I'm I'm quite happy for them to keep signing ex WWE guys if it helps them to better. Exactly, but you. But at yeah, the probably. same time, it, it, you you run the risk of of of. I don't want to say signing too many ex WWE guys, but it, but at the same time, you don't want to be perceived as the company that's re relying sole solely and heavily on the ex WWE guys because they do have some, for lack of a better term, homegrown talent, you know, <clears throat> that are resonating with their audience, you know. I, I don't buy into the Orange Cassidy character. That's just me, my own personal thing, but he's getting over with their audience. And that's what it's about. You know what I mean? Like, just because he's not my personal favorite doesn't mean, you know, it's wrong. Yeah. It, whatever yeah. works, you know? And I look at guys like like uh, a Jungle Boy, for example. And I, I love his energy and his, his enthusiasm. And it's harder for guys his size to get over huge. You know, you guys can do it. Yeah. You take Rey Mysterio who was yep. a guy who was of smaller stature, but ended up becoming a world heavyweight champion and yep. a believable one. That's the challenge, making it yep. believable that this person can become world heavyweight champion without the people going, well, it's pro wrestling. So of course anything's possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rey Mysterio, Daniel Bryan, Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. Yep. You know, the, the guys who exactly. really sort of like helped to pave the way for the, for the guys like Jungle Boy and Darby Allen. Yeah. Right. And you can even throw Shawn Michaels into that category yeah, as yeah. well because back back when he was you know really finding his own it, it was the era of the big guys you know yeah. it was it was yeah. the land of the giants so to speak and and sean being who's not a small guy but in com comparatively speaking but man he, he could just do it all you know it was incredible yeah yeah they were some of my favorite wrestlers because they made me feel like as a kid like i could be a wrestler Right, that, that resonated with me. It made made me feel like I could I could be one of them. Um, and speaking there's of that, favorite, wait, that, that there's that emotional uh, connection that we were yeah. talking about. That, yeah. that's what you want. Sorry, yeah, Go ahead. absolutely. No, no, of course, no. Um, speaking of favorites, now I know you've obviously had a 22 year career, retired 
when, when was it back 2009? 2009. Yeah, 2009. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was around that time. Um, so obviously you, you've done your own thing since then and you've had a lot mm-hmm. of time to reflect on it. You've had some amazing moments, matches, you know, been a part of all those storylines. Who were mm-hmm. some of your favourite wrestlers to work with? Who Was, oh. was there anybody that you ever dreaded working with? Was there anybody that was ever difficult to work with? Um, you know, I, I, I don't recall too difficult a time. I mean, like, uh, like you see in the cover, I, again, she plugged on the cover, but loved working with Undertaker because there was a difference there because, you know, as much as you were the authority figure in the ring, there was still that leery, you know, you kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. thing with the Undertaker. Uh, Edge was awesome to work with. I loved working with Eddie and, and, and Kurt and Chavo and, um, the Hardys and the Dudleys, those tag matches were incre- back when tag teams meant something, you know, back in those <laughs> yeah. days, it was, inc- I've been blessed, man. I, I'm, I can go on for days a day. I got, love working with guys like Kane and guys, you know, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, what a tag team they were, yeah. you know, yeah. forgotten about, you know, I, 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 everybody from Kurt Henning and Macho Man, Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan, Roddy Piper, my goodness, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. I can go on and on. I, I've been blessed. And I, I, I prefer to <clears throat> look at those, those, the, those blessed moments as opposed to saying, oh, well, you know, uh, Vader's debut, he headbutted me and I chipped my tooth and blah, blah, blah. You know, because he, he actually did. Actually. Um, when he first appeared on television, it was a match with him and Savio Vega. And the whole idea premise was he would beat up Savio and <clears throat> throw him out of the ring and I would get in in Vader's face and he would give me a headbutt and, and toss me out as well, you know, showing that he didn't care about anything. He was like, whatever. So he hits me with a headbutt, but he's hold- I had hair back then. So and he's holding onto the sides of my hair. And I, so I couldn't go down and he gave me a second one and I chipped my tooth. I mean, like he clocked me. It was, it was like, I felt it. And he throws me out of the ring <clears throat> and Savio's lying there selling. And you could tell that he, he unfortunately beat the crap out of Savio. And, Savio's a tough guy. So Savio just pulled me over and he put his arm around me. He just says, stay here, bro. You don't have to go anywhere. It's okay. You know, and, I'm, and I'm like, he chipped my tooth. And he says, it's okay. Stay here. You know, but, you know, but again, I prefer to think of the positive moments. Uh, yeah. as, you know, again, a blessed career. I can't, I, you know, I can't, Did I can't thank those guys. I got, I, man, I got to work with some of the biggest names in the history of this industry. That's yeah. Rick Flair. My yeah. goodness, you know. Yeah. Did you did you prefer? I always wonder. Did you prefer working house shows or TV? Because I imagine they're they're mm-hmm. very different days throughout the day, getting ready for yeah. for each one. What what's is is a live show more fun? Is it more carefree, yeah. more relaxed? You can just sort of do your own thing. No, it was more fun because uh, you know, again, like I said, you, you you the guys would experiment. The guys and gals would experiment a little bit at the house shows and try different things and sometimes incorporate you and have a little more fun with you at the house shows, especially when Eddie was going through that lie, cheat and steal era. That was so much fun. And, and, yeah. and getting to do that. And, you know, TV is so regiment, like it, it, it's different at TV where everybody, okay, you've got 12 minutes, including entrances, you know? And like, so now I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm in there trying, trying to relay messages without looking like I'm relaying messages. You know, that's, yeah. that's a challenging part. you like, you're trying to do it, making it look like it's in the part of, you know, your job, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, I guess, I guess there's no pressure, is there? If you go over, that's great for the fans that have come to see. They're getting a bit of a longer yeah. show. Right. Uh, no no pressure, no constraints or anything like that. Um, no, but you might get some heat from the guys in the back going, hey, man, what's up going so long? we got a long drive tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So I want to, um, first of all, thank you so much for joining me. I know I said that at the start. It's been an absolute mm. pleasure, an absolute blast. I always like to end end my interviews with the same question. It's sort of like a themed question, but I like to tailor it to my guests. We, okay. I think we very vaguely mentioned Mount Rushmore at, at the mm-hmm. start of the conversation. I always like to ask my guests what their Mount Rushmore is. But in your case, who would be on your Mount Rushmore of referees? Doesn't have to be from, a, from wrestling. Yeah. As, wow. as a referee, I'm sure you appreciate referees from other sports as well, maybe mm-hmm. football and hockey and things like that. So... Any referees, any sport, who would be on your your Mount Rushmore? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and keep it keep it confined to wrestling because that's that's the, my world. But 
Um, I, I, I would have to put, in my opinion, Tommy Young. Um, you could put both Hepners on there if you want, A and B, yeah. or let's let's put let's put uh, a Hepner as kind of like one there. And um, for me, um, wow, <laughs> you know what? Uh, if you, if you do, uh, I will I will go to Dan Mergliata in the MMA. I mean, like okay. here's a big dude that you know and stuff like that. But uh, as far as referees and wrestling go, Charles has to be on there. Yeah. Love, love Charles. And, uh, and I'm not trying to keep this specifically to WWE, even though I did throw Tommy Young in there. Uh, I love Timmy White. I learned so much from Timmy um, that it is incredible. And, it, yeah. and he, he, he was so open and, and, and just, you could talk to him about anything, not just refereeing, but just about wrestling in general. People, people don't realize that sometimes these ref, uh, some referees, you can talk to him more about the actual match and how matches should progress, it, not just how referees should act. You know, sometimes some referees have a good uh, mind for the business. Let's put it that way. Mm, yeah, lovely. Yeah. That's that's great. That's great to hear. Mine would be um, mine would be Charles, Mike Kyoda, mm -hmm. Earl, and honestly, your good self. These these are the four oh my four goodness. referees who I grew up with. You know, mm. like I say part of some huge moments I, I i tend to try and remember not just the moment not just the wrestlers but everybody involved who was on commentary mm. who yeah. who was wearing the stripes at the time and you know like you say the referees have always been such an important part of the business right that, that you you guys stick out in my head so yeah you you four would be absolutely my my mount rushmore um you thank you for... no thank you thank you honestly like i said big part of my childhood Thank you so much for joining me today. Before I let you go, um, mm -hmm. where can everybody find you on social media? What, uh, oh. Rep and Rant, obviously. You mentioned Rep and Rant quite yeah. a few times. <laughs> yeah, no, the Rep and Rant I do on weekdays from Monday to Friday, and I pick a topic uh, um, to critique. It's not meant, again, as, as a burial. It's, it's, I want to see the product succeed and get better. And these are just my opinions and my, my point of view. So I do my Rep and Rants, and I have... Referent shirts, as you can see, at uh, prowrestlingtees.com. So you can find them there. See, my wife even made me a nice mug <laughs> with, with the logo on there. Um, on social media, at Jimmy Corderas on Twitter, at Real Jimmy Corderas on Instagram. I also have uh, former WWE referee Jimmy Corderas on, on Facebook as well. And uh, yeah, and there's some other stuff in the works, which I can't talk about right now. But uh, there are a few irons in the fire that may be coming out soon. And if they do, I that's where you can find out exactly what's happening. So uh, again, I appreciate you having me on and I, I had a blast chatting and cool. sorry for talking your ear off all <laughs> so long. <laughs> no, honestly, it's fine. I would have let you keep talking for longer and longer. I love, mm. I love hearing stories and I really love hearing stories that, that people don't necessarily know the stuff that we don't hear reported. You know, we hear, we hear the same stories all the time, the Montreal right. screw jobs and what happened there. You know, it's nice right. to hear those little, little nuggets, especially from live shows and backstage that we don't really, mm. we aren't privy to. It's cool to right. sort of get a feel for the inner workings. Cause so many people think that they know wrestling mm. and what's happening backstage because they read the dirt sheets, but obviously yeah. that's, that's just an element. Oh, yeah, it, it, it's funny because, it, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm guilty of uh, surfing the net every once in a while and seeing and but I, I, sometimes I think to myself, I don't want to, because sometimes like, like I said, I like to be surprised sometimes and just, yeah, you know, that's cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you say that's cool. This has been really cool. Jimmy, <laughs> again, thank you so much, guys. You know where to find me. it will be down here somewhere and you can check in the about section. Go to my link tree. That's where the links are to all of the audio platforms. Obviously, you're already here on YouTube. There's pro wrestling tea stores. There's red bubble stores, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. Drop me a like, comment, and a subscribe while you're here. Really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. As usual, Jimmy, again, massive, massive thank you. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your night. And everybody, until next time, take care. Cheers, everyone. Mm -hmm.